Hey folks, so I'm here with Danny Shaw, who's a professor at City University of New York, uh, John Jay College, uh, some other campuses. Uh, he's uh, an outspoken progressive, uh, an opponent of U.S. imperialism, a uh, critic of U.S. foreign policy, and a critic of our U.S. economic system. And it's really a pleasure to have you on, Danny. I really, uh, I think it's really just, just an honor to be able to speak with you. I've seen a lot of your commentary on RT, on press TV, and elsewhere. And so I want to thank you for, for sitting down with us today. Uh, the, the topic that you had brought up that you proposed that we speak about would be the formula uh, dope plus capitalism equals genocide. Uh, can you expound on that, the source of that statement, et cetera? Yeah, definitely. And good evening to everybody. Good to build with you, Caleb. I've been following your work. We go back in the anti-imperialist movement, I think a few decades now. We're not as uh, young as we were in 1998. <laughs> um, yeah, with the new Fred Hampton movie out, uh, I think um, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense uh, is at the forefront of, of people's thinking, as well as it, it, it should be. Uh, Fred Hampton was a, a trailblazer. There's a reason that the state came down so fiercely not just on Chairman Fred, but on the entire Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in Chicago, in Los Angeles, uh, across this country, just in 1969, 28 Panther leaders um, were targeted for assassination and were indeed executed. So what they did to Fred Hampton was not just the physical liquidation, um, the CIA and the FBI and their documentation called it um, neutralization, they weren't going to use the word assassination. They did come up, J. Edgar Hoover, or J. Who Edgar, as the Panthers said, talked about the Black Messiah. So it wasn't just the elimination of one Black Messiah, but a generation of Black women and Black men, the boldest revolutionary Black, Puerto Rican, Chicano, uh, poor white, this Rainbow Coalition leadership. And this leadership, uh, spearheaded by the Panthers, had an incredible vision for how to deal with um, the opioid epidemic. They called it the plague. And if we look at the numbers, I'm gonna get into some of the, the numbers in a few, but um, this plague, the opioid epidemic is worse than ever. So when the Panthers were writing, 1967 and 69 and 1970, when they were at their, their zenith, um, decades later, as this movie uh, hits the well, I don't know if it hit the, the big screen because of, of lockdown, but as people are taking up this conversation again, how important to re-examine how dope plus capitalism continues to cause havoc and, I would argue, genocide in our communities, in our communities as poor white people, in the black community, in the Puerto Rican community, in oppressed communities across this country. Indeed. Um, you know, when you look over the history of the Black Panther Party, um, you know, I mean, they were a very clear Marxist-Leninist uh, organization. I mean, they were, there was huge admiration for Mao in China, for Kim Il-sung, for Fidel Castro. Uh, they had friendly relations with Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. Um, and they very much saw themselves as the precursor to some kind of multinational vanguard party, um, you know, Huey Newton's theory of intercommunalism. Uh, the idea that people should organize their own communities first, but eventually there would be a merger of, of you know, the, the young lords and the young patriots and the Black Panthers and the Gay Liberation Front into one multinational communist party. Uh, their rejection of the left adventurous tactics of the weather underground and the, the, the street fighting and instead advocating a program of survival pending revolution where they, they provide services to people in communities. There's so much we can learn from the Black Panther Party and their history. Um, but the drug issue is a particularly interesting one because, you know, when I was first uh, getting interested in leftist politics, I was in my little town in Ohio. I remember I, I got a copy, a CD of the musical Hair uh, from 1967, 68. And there was a whole, uh, you know, this was a musical about people protesting the Vietnam War and all of that. But there was a whole song glorifying the use of hallucinogens uh, on there. And that in a lot of ways, if you read like the way the history of the 1960s is told, you would get the impression that all the progressive people back then were all promoting drug use and were all getting high and, and drug use was what it meant. And you had Timothy Leary, tune in, turn on, drop out. And that, that drugs was, was part of what it meant to be a progressive. 
Um, but I think you get a very different impression if you go around the world and look at progressive movements, and even if you look at the Panthers. So what were the Panthers' stance on drugs? Can you talk about how they related to the drug question? Yeah, the Panthers put out a pamphlet in the late 1960s, and they had this exact formulation that capitalism plus dope equals genocide. And then I picked up that uh, slogan. It was the 50th anniversary of the Panthers a few years ago, and I wrote 50 years later, um, dope plus capitalism still equals genocide. And I expounded upon where the Panthers were at. And the reason I did that was because of where I come from in uh, Brockton, Massachusetts, in the Bronx, New York, my family, my extended family, um, the people closest to me, uh, genera generationally, because this is, this is generational, it's a historic question, it's a socioeconomic question, social psychology. Um, I've seen uh, this type of thing devastate uh, so many loved ones. And the way Hollywood, you know, capitalism is a myth-making machine. And the way that capitalism, whether it's through there's this Netflix series called The Keepers, um, is actually a new, pre relatively new movie that came out. Um, I don't know if people have seen uh, Hillbilly Elegy. It's, a, it's an interesting book. People should definitely read it. Um, the Netflix just put out a movie based on the book. And it's this um, poor white story from the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and then I think he grew up between Kentucky and, and Ohio. So it takes you into that, that white poverty. And I watched it and I was moved, but there's no systematic analysis. There's no institutional analysis. There's no historic analysis. So what happens to us, Caleb, um, as you know, you've been looking at these things very closely for as long as I have, um, at the end of these movies or these, these books, we're left thinking that it's inevitable. And I remember my grandmother actually knocking me upside the head. Uh, I was 15 years old, and every year I'd go to the Day of Mourning uh, in Plymouth, Massachusetts, where we would remember the true genocidal history of this country and that Thanksgiving wasn't Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving was, you know, genocide day. Um, so we would go to Plymouth, Massachusetts, led by the United American uh, Indians of New England, to remember the true history of this country. And uh, one year we got locked up and attacked by the police, and the police did what they did. They broke actually two of my fingers on my right hand, and I was a basketball player, so it was a big deal at the time. But I was uh, hanging on for dear life to a former Black Panther. This was in 1995. Uh, his name was Ture, I think, Matuzi Ture, and then there was um, Matoi and Munanam and different native leaders. And just for hanging on to them, because the police had attacked us and brutalized us, the police just started, they were trained to just break my fingers one by one. So by my third finger, I, I let go. But I'll never forget when I finally got out of jail, um, I got home, you know, I was late for Thanksgiving, clearly. And my grandmother didn't say, hey, are you okay? How are you? We saw you on TV getting, <laughs> getting brutalized. My grandmother hit me upside the head and she said, don't you know what the Bible says? Don't you know they'll, they'll always be poor? They'll always be rich. There's nothing you can do. And these Indians this and these Indians that, um, all of that, sometimes subtle, sometimes right in your face. With working class white people, there's no way to dress it up. I grew up hearing the N-word. I grew up hearing the, the S-word for Latinos. That stuff was all over the place. Um, and my grandmother was only reinforcing what she had been taught her entire life through all of the ideological institutions of this society, that repression and oppression was inevitable and that I should be staying home like a good Thanksgiving, you know, boy from a, from, from a working class family. And she was drilling into me what had been drilled into her. But I never stopped questioning. And I always knew that this suffering, that this PTSD, that this generational trauma, which then led to addiction, there was nothing natural about it. So that's what got me from a young age looking at the Panthers. The Panthers were organic intellectuals of their time. The Panthers took on these big questions about the potential of the lumpen proletariat, because Marx and Engels had concluded that the lumpen proletariat would produce more um, scabs and snitches. Um, they used the word snitches, not scabs, but than anything else. Whereas the Panthers had a different look at the everyday sisters and brothers on the block. 
So when you go back to my class roots, there's this combination. I think our class roots for a lot of uh, poor white people are more complex than society lets on. This whole myth of the middle class, I mean, there were quote unquote petty bourgeois middle class elements to my family, but we were poor. We were always struggling, single single mothers and, and hustling and all that stuff. So, so my roots range from lump into working class to petty bourgeois, there's that, there's that mix with this or that, aunt, uncle, grandmother. So I think from a young age, Caleb, I don't want to over-exaggerate, but I was like six, seven, eight, asking my mother, why is there sex work? Because, you know, you would say in the street, prostitute. But then my mom would be like, well, is prostitute the word? So from eight years old, I'm asking these, these big questions. So I was, on a, I was on a mission. I was on a quest, which led me to this, this writing and this, and this research and, and trying to publish a different different conclusions because if you just watch hillbilly elegy which is just the latest thing out on on netflix which deals with the dope game and, and heroin you just left to believe that some of us have it rough and that's just the way life is and i'm saying no 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 there's nothing natural about this system there's nothing natural about most of our family members enduring and surviving sexual violence and incest and horrible horrible stuff and I knew it wasn't just my family. And then, I, then I'm living in Haiti, and I'm living in the Dominican Republic, and I'm living in Brazil. I was an internationalist from a young age, and I seen the same generational stuff, which set me out on this, on this quest. Wow. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, I think about my own roots. Um, you know, my, my mother's maiden name is Finney, um, and I'm descended, you know, on both sides, I'm an Irish American, but I'm an Irish Protestant. And, um, you know, I'm descended from a very important figure in American history named Charles G. Finney. And he was a, an abolitionist here in New York City, very opposed to slavery. He was a minister. He wouldn't give uh, communion to any slaveholder or anyone involved in the slave trade. And he was famous for that. And he moved out to Ohio. And that's, I mean, that's my family's been in Ohio, you know, for, for many generations. Um, but one big thing about this kind of progressive uh, view, you know, and this guy was an abolitionist. He was early in fighting for the rights of women was he was absolutely opposed to drinking alcohol. And uh, John Brown, I understand, was also very opposed to drinking alcohol and that his movement, you know, to, you know, and eventually, you know, taking Harper's Ferry, he didn't uh, believe in drinking alcohol. And then I later found out that John Reed, uh, you know, who was portrayed in that Hollywood movie Reds, which is again, just kind of a, you know, a, a knockoff of history. One of the reasons he didn't get along too well with the Bolsheviks when he was in the Soviet Union uh, was because he didn't drink. Uh, he, you know, and that actually there is an old current in U.S. history of kind of New England radicals of people that fought for women's rights or fought uh, against slavery, uh, fought against racism. The early socialist movement, a lot of the utopians, uh, they felt that drinking alcohol, alcohol was something that the bosses would use to control people, um, and that. And, you know, they talk about when they built the railroads throughout this country, you know, millions, well, not, not millions, but thousands of Irish people died, worked to death building the railroads. And one of the ways they controlled the Irish workers uh, who built those railroads was by, like, basically giving them some of their pay in alcohol, uh, you know, to, to, you know, to make sure that, that they, were, they were drunk a lot, you know, and they would get their pay in whiskey as a way of controlling them. Um, and that, that drugs, you know, they are a way of controlling people, no doubt about it. Uh, Aldous Huxley. He wrote that book, um, The Doors of Perception, which is a big, uh, a big favorite among the, the drug using crowd. But he also wrote a book, a novel called Brave New World. And in Brave New World, it's this fantasy, this ruling class fantasy about controlling the masses uh, by having them doped up and on drugs all the time. And it's interesting because, you know, people want to act like everything is separate, right? They talk about addiction and opioids and painkillers and how they destroy communities. They talk about drug culture and, and you know, hippies and counterculture and hallucinogens. And then they talk about legal drugs and prescription drugs and how nowadays a lot of children are put on prescription medications, uh, you know, at a very young age. And, and it just becomes part of their life that they're just constantly taking psych meds or something to control their behavior. This doping up of society, uh, it seems to be a big part of what the ruling class wants and they're doing it for the purpose of trying to control the people and trying to stay at the top and prevent the people from rising up and taking what's theirs. I mean, do you see this continuity? Yeah, you covered uh, so much there. The bullet point deserves an entire conversation. But 
hearing you took me back to um, so much. I was in uh, Praia in Cape Verde, the capital of Cape Verde. I was out there um, researching the life and work of Amilca Cabral and the PAIGC, the Cape Verdean and, and Guinean African Independence Party. And I remember in Cape Verde, in, in the most depressed communities, it was it was like it was like a cemetery, um, but with, with 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 zombies. The alcoholism, and it's not just Cape Verde. I just walk out walk down the block to 149th Street here in the South Bronx, or go back home to see. Um, my family in Brockton, Massachusetts. So it's it's not somehow unique to Cape Verde, but I just remember the descendants of Amilca Cabral, this incredible historical social potential and how many people's lives have been kidnapped and abducted in these different ways. And then another snapshot, I was in Recife in Brazil, organizing with the MST, uh, the movement of, of the landless, o MST, in, in the northeast of Brazil. And there were these homeless uh, children, eight years old, 12 years old, and they were like little zombies. And they were drinking at eight years old because they were hungry, they couldn't fall asleep, and they were sniffing glue. So what we're talking about here is a globalized system of oppression, of social control. I think we have to go back to the work of Gary uh, Webb, the journalist from the San Jose Mercury, who very mysteriously um, appeared with two bullets in his in his head after all of his research revealed that the Drug Enforcement Agency and the intelligence agencies of the United States, the central intelligence agencies, were working hand in hand with international cartels, including the Contras in Nicaragua, to wage this illegal war. Um, it's no secret today how much. Uh, Cocaine is coming through Colombia, but then they want to put a, a $15 million bounty on Nicolas Maduro's head as though it was coming through Venezuela when no State Department research, even even their own research, forget independent critical research, um, but they want to use, they already have nine military bases in Colombia, so they don't have to vilify Colombia, they have to vilify Venezuela. Uh, and certainly like that movie with Denzel showed American gangster when they were hiding the dope, bringing it back um, through Vietnam, even hiding it in the, in the coffins. That was a, an epic scene. So I think we know, and I'm not getting into any type of conspiracy theory, and I can't connect all of the dots, um, but Gary Webb did connect those dots, and, uh, and, and Jeffrey Cockburn, and... and and, and Counterpunch and so many of these different analysts and researchers have shown over and over that you can follow the path of U.S. occupations um, from Afghanistan to, to Mexico, direct control, uh, indirect control. And if they can build walls to keep out human beings, um, how is it that in all of our neighborhoods it's flooded with what you mentioned, the legalized dope? Because it's such a fine line. I mean, we all know the Percocets, the oxy, Oxycontin, after a few weeks, months, you, you, you can't maintain. And then with the heroin, then you need fentanyl. It's a never-ending cycle. Um, the Center for Disease Control actually put out some, some numbers um, at the beginning of the pandemic. And their numbers showed that uh, the number of overdoses have now eclipsed in the year uh, 80,000 for, for last year. So every year we're setting new records. So Caleb, we have to ask the big questions. Richest economy in the history of the world, $25 trillion economy, 80,000 plus. And those are just the official overdoses. How many of our people have never even recorded their lives are worth very little? Um, so that's what got, you know, set me in motion. We started organizing something called the People's Vigils because so many of our people were dying but then it would be like this isolated death. And it was like, how can we collectivize these tears? Because uh, if something happens to your children, that those are our children, that those are society's children. Yeah. So we tried to, in the most um, passionate way, collectivize the tears in the morning. So we started a project uh, a few years back called The People's Vigils. Um, and I think that still has a lot of, of potential because if someone overdoses in Ohio in a small town, if somebody overdoses in, in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, if somebody overdoses here in the South Bronx, capitalism, 
teaches us to individualize it. Ah, oh, that person was a junkie. That person was a tecato. That person was a wino. That, that, that woman was a, I'm not even going to repeat th these words, right? And they criminalize us and they blame us and we internalize it. And we blame our own ourselves and we blame our own people. But Paulo Freire, with the work he did in Brazil, he had an excellent quote, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, you're not a drunk, you're not a bum, you're not a, a S-L-U-T, you're not a, you're none of these words, you're oppressed. There's a material basis to explain what's happening to us. Because if it was just my family, then you could say, oh, he, you know, he, he comes from this rough, rough family. They got to get it together. They got to pull up their American boots and blah, 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 blah. But when you look around and it's Michigan and it's and it's Kansas and it's California and it's Hawaii. I was out in Hawaii doing research on, on Puerto Rican roots, crystal meth epidemic. So that's Caleb, that's what got, got me asking all these these big questions. I'll react to a, a couple of things you said. I mean, as far as Gary Webb and his revelations about, you know, the US government, you know, actively arming the Contras while they were selling cocaine and eventually crack and, and doing all of the work that they were doing in Nicaragua, murdering people and, and the CIA being, you know, involved with them and all of that. You know, it's interesting because we're constantly given a body count of communism. That's like the argument the right wing gives. Well, it's like, oh, communism killed a million people. It's like, think about what the body count for U.S. foreign policy in the 70s and 80s was. So, you know, if you look at the fact that the U.S. government in Nicaragua, in Honduras, in El Salvador, in Colombia was arming drug dealers, was setting up, giving guns to and setting up, you know, anti-communists to be drug dealers and have lots of weapons and all of that, whether it was to fight the FARC in Colombia or to fight against the Sandinistas or, or whatever. And even today, you know, decades and decades later, in 2020, those countries are still devastated by by narco gangs and chaos and murder and death. Honduras now has the highest murder rate in the world. Um, you know, you look at, you know, what has happened in El Salvador, if you look at what's happened in Colombia. I mean, if we're gonna do a body count, just the US government alone making that decision to arm drug dealers and terrorists to fight communists in the 80s, the body count there is in the millions, I would think, you know? Uh, but there's no, no one says, well, capitalism killed all these people. That's just the, nat well, that just happens, right? It's not, you know, and that's the way that these, these folks argue. Um, but there, there was another thing you said that, that I, I wanted to react to. Um, I'm trying to think about what it was because, because there was a lot that you said there and, and I'm just trying to, you know, but that, that point needs to be made about, about the, the, the fact that, you know, this decision and, and when you, when people talk about conspiracy theories, I guess, you know, it's interesting because we can talk about what we know. Right. There are things that we know. Right. And you talk about connecting the dots. We know a lot of dots. Right. We know that the U.S. government, was proven by Gary Webb, was arming drug dealers in South and Central America. That we know is a fact. We also know that the CIA had a program for a long time called MK Ultra, um, And MK Ultra was about uh, basically distributing LSD to college students. Uh, you know, uh, distributing LSD to random people on the streets of San Francisco. They had Operation Midnight Climax. So the CIA had a whole program about how to weaponize drug use, right? Now, again, you know, that's something that we know. That is fact, right? Um, and uh, there are other things that we know. Um, and so it's like we, we, we have a dot here, we have a dot there, um, and people want to come up with where's the coherent narrative. Look, I mean, you can go back as, as far back as the Opium War. You know, China, the emperor, tried to ban the importing of opium into Britain. And the British Empire, you know, declared war on China, not once but twice, to maintain the right of the British Empire to sell drugs to China. And the result of, of forcing China to open up its economy, forcing them to allow the, the opium, you know, to come in, forcing them to allow British manufacturers to come in and put them out of business. You know, according to some recent studies in China, they estimate that the death toll, the result of devastating China's economy, bringing in the drugs, not allowing them to develop. Uh, the, the result of the opium wars is, is over 100 million people probably died as a result of, of those policies, right? So, you know, and, and it seems like, you know, I mean, you're talking about Afghanistan. Now, Afghanistan, ever since the USA invaded, has become the center of the global heroin trade. Something like, you know, like 50% of the world's heroin originates in Afghanistan. 
Um, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole lot of dots you can connect, but it all points to uh, drugs as a weapon of the ruling class uh, to oppress people. It all points to, it all points to the fact that, and, and what's weird is that, you know, it, it's like they have it both ways. So at the same time that they're, they're using drugs to control people, the hysteria about drugs, right? The 1980s, war on drugs. That's how they used mass incarceration. So it's like they're hitting with, with two fists. I remember sitting uh, as a kid in the in the very very dumb assemblies that we would have a police officer would you know would sit up there and you know just say no kids just say no and he light something on fire. Do you know this smell? If this is coming from your big sister or your big brother's room, this is marijuana. That's what this smell is. And yeah, you know, and and we'd all be smelling this and going, oh, it smells awful. And I mean, it was just the dumbest thing, right? And it's mass incarceration locking people up. And we know that when people go to prison for using drugs, they don't become clean and, and be good ever since then. They, they tend to, you know, it tends to make their lives even worse and make the problems that cause people to become addicted uh, even more intense. So, I mean, there's so many, so many ways where this is just like the perfect hustle for the ruling class. Get people addicted, then lock them in prison for using drugs. Uh, use the drugs to, uh, to set up terrorist groups. I mean, I mean this, is, this is like the, the ruling class's best game. Um, but yet I continue to meet people, you know, in the working class movement, people that are socialists and progressives, that, that they just have this emotional gut reaction. No, no, pot is good. No, no, drugs are good. No, I mean, and they, they, they have this like, they're, they, they just don't want to hear this, right? And I know that when I put this video up, there are going to be a slew of negative comments below. I mean, and a, a lot of people that love everything I have to say, they say, Caleb, stay away from this drug stuff. You know, drugs are not so bad. This is ruling class propaganda. You know, LSD changed my life. Uh, you know, I tripped and that's how I became a socialist. A lot, I mean, and, and this is, you know, these are fighting words. Everything we're saying on here to a lot of people in the progressive community is fighting words. Well, so don't take me down on? with you. Don't take me down with you. <laughs> What's, what, what is going on here? Why do people have this emotional reaction when you just point to these basic facts? Well, well, I'm not conflating me personally, recreational drug use with systematic sure. uh, addiction. If someone decides they want to smoke their weed, uh, pfft, that's, that's the least of my problems. That's not what we're critiquing here. And I always uh, joke with my, my students because if you smoke your marijuana here or there to, to rest, de-stress, whatever, that, that's your business. But if you need marijuana all day, every day, that's a different conversation. And that's a conversation that, that we should have. Um, and I've seen you know, people very close to me, the people I love the most in the world, and, and, and no amount of weed was ever enough. And they'd be so high out of their minds and keep smoking. And I'm like, isn't there like an actual limit where you can't get any higher? And they would just laugh at me and, and keep going and burn all types of holes in the, in the, in, in the pillows. But that's a different story. It's funny, I was so little and I smelled the marijuana everywhere around neighbors, family, whatever. And I always associated it with um, poverty, poor white people, where I was from, and domestic violence, because the, the two seem to go hand in hand. I'm not, I'm not saying there's a scientific correlation. I'm just saying as a six-year-old, that's what I put together. Because it was- The women's movement in the USA said the same thing, right? Uh, you know, care, I think it was, was it Carrie Nation? Or, I mean, some of the early feminists were also people that were advocates of prohibition, because- in the 1800s, 1900s, people linked beating beating up women and domestic violence to alcoholism. They thought that the, the two walked hand in hand. I mean, that's that. I mean, that was kind of a common feeling. Um, and I know in Russia there have been big temperance movements among the Communist Party uh, that had a similar feeling that you know that when men are drinking lots of alcohol, uh, that's when domestic abuse happens. I don't think that's I don't think that's a spurious connection. I think no, no, for sure. I just didn't want to be saying that somehow sure. it's connected scientifically to marijuana. No, the alcohol, the, no question. And it's interesting how different cultures approach this subject. Uh, when I lived in the Dominican Republic and I organized with the marxist leninist clandestine movement in DR from 97 to 2001, Dominican culture, very Catholic. Spent mm -hmm. colonialism, you know, Catholicism. And when they take your spirituality, like John Henry Clark says, then they've taken everything. And in DR, I was publishing a tribute to Bob Marley. This is in 1999, 2000. And they wouldn't let me publish it because they said, Bob Marley is a tecato. He's a horrible fiend. Un viciado. He's a drug addict. And I was like, damn, Bob Marley? 
I mean, that's part of Rasta culture and, and Jamaican cu culture and Indians who were abducted into um, indentured servitude first brought the ganja to Jamaica, there's that whole history. Shout out to Rasta and Resistance, one of my, my favorite books by a Jamaican uh, professor. We actually He actually talks about the CIA, how the CIA infiltrated the Rastas in Antigua, in, in Grenada, how the Rastas could be a revolutionary force, but if they were infiltrated by the U.S. state, clearly they could be a, a reactionary force. Rasta and Resistance, an incredible um, book. Um, when we look back at white supremacy and settler colonialism, mm -hmm. um, they colonized, to paraphrase Desmond Tutu, they colonized with a gun in one hand and a, and a Bible in the other. Um, but if they had a third hand, and Walter Rodney talked about how colonialism was a one-armed bandit, but if they had a third hand, it would have been a bottle of, of moonshine, a bottle of, of liquor, of fire water, it was, as it was translated into many indigenous languages, because the reservations, the poorest, most arid land in the Dakotas and across the Southwest, what did they do? In, in, they surrounded the reservations with these taverns and with these pubs and the highest rates of alcoholism, the highest rates of PTSD, the highest rates of these social indicators um, are in the indigenous community. They're in poor white America, they're in the black community, they're in the Chicano nation, they're in the, because those are the most oppressed people. And I'm not trying to get into any type of oppression Olympics about poor whites have it as bad. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But that's a real question to struggle with. Do poor whites have a voice in America? And to say that Trump was somehow a voice for poor whites, well, Trump is $3.5 billion in, in wealth. So how could he be the white knight, the savior of poor whites? But that's how they hoodwinked and bamboozled us. Trump had a whole media apparatus and other billionaires, an entire system behind him, and then an entire system against him, which was CNN and, and, and MSNBC. But neither is a solution for oppressed people, including poor whites. But I think one thing that's, that's fascinating, Caleb, in 2016, I don't know if you remember this study, but a study came out called the Oxy Electorate. Hmm. And they looked at the poorest counties in Pennsylvania, in the Rust Belt, Erie, Pennsylvania, in Cleveland, Ohio, in East Cleveland, and, and, and they looked at poor white poverty. Um, and they found that this Oxy Electorate, where there were the most opioid overdoses, they were voting in some of the highest rates for Donald Trump. Yep. You have to ask yourself, how could the Democrats be such a miserable failure that somehow poor whites in, in big, big numbers are seeing this businessman, this, this hustler, this real estate developer, the arch capitalist, the very, okay, Washington outsider, but Wall Street insider. I mean, the very, the very essence of, of capitalism, how did he become the quote unquote solution for poor whites? So that's where I've tried to do a lot of organizing, but I mean, a lot of my family members, if I even mention Venezuela, if, if, if they ever see me in, 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 in the ideological work, my writing and the media work that we do, they're already cursing me out before I even get home or before the barbecue even starts. So this whole thing, and this is another thing that we can dismantle and deconstruct. A lot of times they'll throw out this line, white people need to organize white people. Mm -hmm. What the heck? What does that mean in reality? Mm -hmm. You like you want to you want to grab a helicopter and drop me and Kayla, Caleb in the middle of Oklahoma? And we just start talking to people? That's not how organizing works. Because the U.S. working class is multinational. So if I have a job at Amazon, like the, everything's popping off right now in Alabama with Amazon. What, the black workers are just going to talk to the black workers? And the white workers are just going to talk? That's ridiculous. So we're going to organize where there's potential to organize. I'm not going to start knocking on brick heads of my own cousins or who knows who. If they don't want to hear it, what can I do? There can't be a, a dialogue. So I think there's so many different approaches to this conversation. But with 80,000 deaths last year, every year we set a new record. I remember in 2018, the big statistic was more people in the U.S. had overdosed and died from opioids than, than U.S. soldiers had died in the Vietnam War. And I'll never say the Vietnam War because it wasn't the Vietnam War. It was a, a war of U.S. aggression, a genocidal war against the people of Vietnam. 
So terminology, terminology is, is key. I talk to my students about language liberation. And if you hear how the Koreans remember the 1950 to 1953 war, it's a war of US invasion and occupation and genocide. You were talking about that tally, the, 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 the death tolls to bring it full circle. I remember Dick Gregory, the great comedian, you know, he said that what the U.S. has done would make um, fascists blush. He used the specific example of, of, of the Nazis. And what Dick Gregory was saying that was that the, the length of the Cold War, the napalm over Greece, the napalm over Vietnam, um, how the, the Cold War, which was never a Cold War. You know, I'm a student of Sam, Sam Marcy, which is how we, we first met, you know, ages ago. Um, Sam Marcy said it was a global class struggle. How did that global class struggle, that quote unquote Cold War play out in Nicaragua, in Southern Africa, in, in Ethiopia, in Eritrea? And when you begin to do that body count, I mean, Caleb, you know, when you do that body count, you eclipse what, what the Nazis were capable of. And I'm not trying to make light. Uh, uh, I, it's, not, it's important not to make historical comparisons because no one Holocaust is better or worse. A Holocaust is a Holocaust, but let's employ the correct vocabulary. A genocide is a genocide. A Holocaust, Holocaust is a Holocaust. What happened to Zimbabwe? What happened to Mozambique? What happened to all these oppressed countries? The length of the Cold War has to be unpacked. It's funny because I look at what's happening in Texas right now. And I think, you know, the people in Texas ought to be Stalinists right now. They ought to be big admirers of Stalin. Because what did Stalin do? Lenin said that Soviet power, right, uh, that he said that communism is Soviet power plus electrification. And then Stalin made it happen, right? He built the world's biggest power plants. He took the, the barren agrarian countryside of the Soviet Union and he electrified it and he turned Russia into you know, an industrial superpower. And as far as the Soviet Union and Stalin were concerned, communism meant bringing electricity and, and building up infrastructure and not just power plants, but water systems and steel mills. And, you know, I mean, that's what communism was in the Soviet Union. And that's what it has been in China. I mean, the largest power plant in the world today is the, uh, is the Three Gorges Dam in China. It's a state dam built by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, around the world, people understand that communism is about building things. It's about, you know, I mean, Gaddafi, he built the world's largest irrigation system, the Great Man-Made River, right? It was about irrigating the desert so the Libyans could start growing their own food and having more food independence. Um, you talk about how the, the biggest power plant in the Middle East is the Aswan Dam that was built by Abdel Nasser, the socialist leader of Egypt in coordination with Khrushchev and the Soviet Union. And that, you know, this, this notion that communism just makes everyone poor or that communism is a destructive ideology that's about, you know, breaking things and tearing things down is just false. And I mean, if you look at Texas, right, I mean, you talked about Trump and the Trump movement. The Republicans might claim to be populists on behalf of low income white people. They have devastated low income white communities. I mean, and and, you know, and I, I shouldn't even say white communities, because at this point, you know, there's more integration than ever before. A lot of New Yorkers have it in their minds that, like, if you get outside of an urban center, everyone is white and they're all, you know, in the Ku Klux Klan. And that's just not true. I mean, low income white people in the United States are more integrated than ever before in U.S. history. I don't know any white person. I cannot think of any white person I know who does not have a person of color who's married into their family, whether it's an Asian, whether it's a Latino or a black person. I don't know of any all white families at this point. You know, I mean, everyone's got an aunt or an uncle who is not white and that you know, the low income white workers, you know, they are much more conservative and much more Republican leaning uh, than than urban middle class white people, no doubt about it. But but I wouldn't say that they are that they are, you know, that they're completely segregated. I and mean, that's like a misconception, I think. Um, and the communities that low income white people live in have been devastated by free market policies. I mean, they're unpaving the roads in 27 different states right now. They are unpaving the roads. There are, there are municipalities that cannot afford to maintain paved roads. So they have this machine they call a reclaimer. And it goes in and it rips up the asphalt and pulverizes it. And where you used to have a paved road, you have a dirt road. I mean, that's what capitalism is doing. This is not economic development. This is complete decay. And a lot of what the opioid crisis and the prison industrial complex is about 
is that basically the standard of living for average Americans of all nationalities is going down and down and down, and they still need a way to make money. So, you know, we can't spend like we used to. Uh, they don't have factories for us to work in. So they can lock us in jail. Um, they can, you know, they can push doctors to over-prescribe over opioid pain medications. It's, it's about trying to squeeze every last dollar out of the American working class as they drive the living standards lower and lower. Um, I also thought it was interesting when you talked about Rastafarianism. Um, you know, I wrote a book about Kamala Harris, kind of an essay in three parts about Kamala Harris, because uh, her father is from Jamaica, and she appeared on The Breakfast Club, the African-American-themed uh, radio program. Kamala Harris did. Um, and on the program, they asked Kamala Harris, uh, you know, she's now our vice president, uh, have you ever smoked marijuana? And she laughed, and, and she said, half my family's from Jamaica. What do you think? Her father... Donald Harris, who is the economic advisor to uh, the manly government of Jamaica and is kind of a social democrat, he heard that and he was furious and he denounced her. He denounced her in the U.S. media. Um, and he and her are estranged from each other. And he said that the stereotype of Jamaicans as dope smoking joy seekers who are irresponsible and, and such is, is a, a stereotype that he and his family uh, in Jamaica, the Harris family, uh, you know, that's where her name Harris comes from. Uh, you know, they, they find that to be very offensive. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting. But what many people saw on that Breakfast Club interview uh, that was particularly offensive from Kamala Harris is the fact that, you know, she laughed, you know, oh, half my family's from Jamaica. Ha ha ha. But what's funny about it is, is she put over 1,500 people in prison for smoking marijuana. Her whole career as a prosecutor in the 1990s and as the, as the rate of incarceration in California was skyrocketing, was all about destroying people's lives, making them felons for life uh, for smoking marijuana. And then they ask her about it, and it doesn't even occur to her when she's saying it that, that maybe she should say no because people might see the hypocrisy there. It doesn't even occur to her, right? Um, you know, and then other people have, have pointed out that, you know, Kamala Harris, she loves to pander, uh, you know, and that, you know, she talks about smoking marijuana in college and the music. She says she listened to Snoop Dogg, and Snoop Dogg was not popular at the time she was in college, so she's probably making the whole thing up anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, and then later, uh, you know, she referred to, I think she gave an interview and she referred to Tupac as the best rapper alive, um, at which point, you know, some people thought that was just a gap, and other people said, well, maybe she knows something we don't know. Let's not forget, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. Um, but, you know, I mean, you know, Kamala Harris, in, in a lot of ways, there's kind of a disingenuousness that comes out of the liberals these days. And I think a lot of working class people pick up on that. You know, Rush Limbaugh, he, he died today, awful, awful person. I, I mean, I couldn't stand, I mean, such such offensive racist material, uh, you know, I mean, supporting the prison industrial complex, you know, tearing down low income people, the myth of the welfare mother. But part of the reason I think that he had an appeal was that a lot of people could pick up on the disingenuousness of liberal politicians. You know, there's, they seem very fake. You know, the Clintons, Bill Clinton, when he was president and claimed he, he cared about working people and such, and that, that you know, Republicans, uh, they, they mean what they say. What they say is awful, but they mean it. You know what I'm saying? But, but the liberals, they always have this very fake, fake virtue signaling. And, and I think Rush Limbaugh, part of the key to his success as a radio host in the United States was that he was very good at picking up on that fakeness in Democrats. And a lot of working class people that are white could also pick up on that. And he was he he picked up on that fakeness of 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 Democrats and liberals and kind of, you know, you know, just, you know, knew how to just, you know, lampoon them for it. And that made him quite successful. And I think that may have been part of the secret of Rush Limbaugh's success. But, you know, that's I'm, I'm reacting to a lot of different things you said. But what's on your mind? Oh, man, uh, I, I, when you brought up Rush Limbaugh, I mean, a true ideological enemy, a true ideological nemesis, like you said. But it reminds me of that Malcolm X quote that uh, who's more dangerous to our communities, uh, the wolf or the fox? The wolf, you can see the Donald Trumps and the Rush Limbaugh's and Fox News and Newsmax. And you can see them from far away. But the fox, um, the fox sneaks up on you and, and hides their teeth. And yeah, that whole posturing from Kamala Harris on The Breakfast Club four years ago was Hillary Clinton trying to say she always kept a bottle of hot sauce in her pocketbook, trying to pander to the black community. I mean, people see right through that. So the Republican, you know, Trump's win was was a slap in the face of, of the liberals and showed how pathetic these, these liberals 
were. So it's important to uh, to put that out there. Yeah, the appeal of a, a Rush Limbaugh, I, I work construction and landscaping for rich, rich white families and most of the crew. It was um, immigrants from El Salvador, Mexico, Brazil, but there were a bunch of, of white guys on the crew too, just trying to survive. And Sometimes they would come up with such homophobic, racist stuff. I was just like, where do they even come up with this stuff? Like words I'd never even heard, even though I've been around this stuff my entire life because of where I, I come from. But they'd have Rush Limbaugh on, and they would they would refer to these talk show hosts and, and the Fox News hosts, um, Fucker Carlson, Tucker Carlson. Um, they would always refer to them on a first-name basis. Rudy Giuliani and Donald or, or Trump, as if so, somehow these elite whites who went to Trinity College and went to, they do not give a fuck about you, but somehow um, their appeal, mm -hmm. their talking points, because it's, it's dialectical, right? Because the liberals are so fake, the liberals have inadvertently and they're too arrogant and out of touch to even realize this. And that's why I've appreciated your analysis uh, over the years, Caleb. The, the liberals have pushed working class white America and poor whites into the lap of the Republicans. Mm -hmm. Look what they did to Bernie, to isolate Bernie and not to give Bernie the nomination. And look how they've, uh, you know, the unofficial religion of this country is anti-socialism and, and, and anti-communism. I thought it was real interesting uh, earlier, something came up for me when you mentioned the, the temperance movement um, or prohibition in, in, in Russia and the Soviet Union. There was an incredible passage. I think it's in the Russian Revolution or maybe My Life or another book. Um, but some of the leaders of the Russian Revolution, they talk about when the people finally took power, they ransacked the, the vodka um, cellars and the wine cellars. And there was just this carnival of, of liberation, but all types of soldiers abandoned their posts and all types of, uh, uh, of, of leaders you know, woke up in the streets drunk. So... I'll never forget that that passage. Again, I'm not calling for any type of radical abolition or nothing, but it is interesting. Um, all day we work, we're alienated, you know, threefold. We're alienated from ourselves, we're alienated from our species, being, we're alienated from nature it, itself, we're alienated from the product of our labor, we're, we're alienated from the the process itself of, of working. So yeah, at the end of the day, we we want to fall asleep, and whether we pick our drug, whether our drug is is a few shots, or, or, or it's a few beers, or it's some Tom Brady and NFL football, or it's, a, or it's a bunch of weed, we need to numb ourselves, and, and that's where the deeper question comes in. Why do we have to numb ourselves? Why is life alienating when life should be bountiful, and we all have so much human potential? And in Venezuela, despite the blockade, Venezuela is a war on Venezuela. To quote Atilio Borron, Argentinian militant, Argentinian sociologist, he equates the U.S. unilateral blockade against Venezuela to the equivalent of dropping atomic bombs on Venezuela. And I don't think that's hyperbole. And I was just in Venezuela a few weeks ago, and that's what I've seen, especially since 2014 when the international oil market uh, tanked. Um, and uh, in, in, in Venezuela, despite this blockade, they still pass legislation. A few years back now, the work week wouldn't be a 40-hour work week. It would be a 30-hour work week to give workers more time to do what workers should do. So here in this country, we're so alienated. We don't even know what alienation means because we, we, we haven't had this, this, this opportunity. So for me, um, I became kind of uh, an organic intellectual of my own family experience, of the own social rungs that I escaped, endured. I carry my own, you know, my own, my own PTSD. I carry my own recovery story. I come out of the rooms and shout out to everybody in the rooms. You know, recovery taught me so much. And 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 one thing before I throw it back to you, because sometimes I just can't resist with this stuff. But when I went into the rooms, you know, I, and, and we never go in on a winning streak. We go in because we have 
uh, mess up our lives so bad that there's nowhere else to run and everything else that we thought was going to work, whether it was therapy or, 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 or boxing or, or, or training or, or journaling, clearly it wasn't enough. So we end up in the rooms and I went in there like with my Black Panther, Young Lords, Rainbow Coalition, Socialism, you know. And one of the first things you, you learn with the 12 steps, there's also 12 traditions. And we say that the 12 steps keep us from killing ourselves and the 12 traditions keep us from killing one another because you can't bring religious matters or political matters to any type of meeting. Because picture in whatever part of this country, we start having opinions on Russiagate. We start having opinions on Libya and, and what NATO and the U.S. did to Libya, right? So tradition 10, we're not going to bring political or religious matters into the conversation, right? And that for me was very interesting because I was uh, so politicized, but also fucked up in the game as, as I'm sharing, right? So for me, it was very interesting in the rooms to depoliticize myself and get spiritual and just focus on um, the stuff that I was, I was struggling with. And then uh, to try to be a sponsor to people who came from a completely different political ideology, a completely different background. They could be orthodox, religious, this or that, but it didn't matter because we were focused on a common solution and that was recovery. So recovery helped me grow in ways that, I don't know if you could ever say non-ideological because for me, even though I can't bring this into the rooms directly, recovery is never an individual thing. And that's what the Panthers really got. And that's why the state had to take out the Panthers. I think the CPUSA in the 1930s and then the Panthers getting the Rainbow Coalition off the ground in the 1960s, late 60s, these are the two most advanced attempts at revolution in the history of this country. Maybe if we go back, well, certainly Black Reconstruction, the second American uh, revolution. There's so much to analyze, but certainly the 1930s, 1960s, this country's on the brink of a revolution. And the Panthers were, were spearheading that attempt. And that's not to say the Panthers didn't have all of their contradictions, but that movie, Caleb, uh, I'm not sure if you saw the movie yet, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. Well, I don't want to give a, you know, no, no um, teasers, but um, th there's a scene where Fred Hampton checks some young Panthers because they're trying to um, take liberties. That was the Panther slang for uh, hooking up with women in the movement or, or hitting on women. And they talk about no taking liberties with, with, with sister comrades. Everyone has to see that, that movie. I, I think nothing can recreate Fred Hampton in, in 1969, but Fred Hampton Jr. and Mama Kua, Fred Hampton's partner, who somehow survived that FBI Chicago police attack that horrific night in, in 1969, they helped produce it, Fred Hampton's family members and his son and Rosa Clemente and so many other great revolutionaries. So I think highly recommend that film. You, you can have whatever critique. At the end of the day, Hollywood is, is Hollywood or, or, or it's, it's, it's never going to be an exact documentary of who Fred Hampton was. But I think they, given the conditions, I would dare to say they did the best job possible. Let me ask you, you know, I know very little about the 12 step recovery world. Right. And that's that's something that has touched so many people in this country and all over the world. I mean, from all kinds of different demographics of society, uh, you know, you know, all kinds of communities. And it, it's something that many people have been involved with. And it's interesting because over the years, I've known many like radicals and communists and leftists who are part of that world. But I've also known many radicals and leftists and communists that are highly critical of that of that world. And I really just don't know anything about it. I did just read, interestingly, I, I was reading of all things about the history of the Super Bowl, okay, and the Super Bowl halftime show. And I found out that the Super Bowl halftime show was originally started by this, this kind of like progressive, but kind of religious singing group in the 70s called Up With People. And Up With People originally came out of something called moral rearmament, uh, which used to be called the Oxford Group, uh, which was like a kind of a, an attempt to get British conservatives in Britain to turn against the Nazis and that Alcoholics Anonymous actually comes out of, of the Oxford Group. So there's like some weird, um, you know, history there. And it was like, I guess it was like a, a kind of a, 
a religious lifestyle movement that they were pushing in Britain in the lead up to the Second World War to get conservatives to oppose the Nazis. Um, and that's the Oxford group, and that the Oxford group has something to do with the starting of AA. But other than that, I don't really know much about it. I don't really have any direct experience other than knowing people who were involved and said it was amazing, and knowing other people who were involved and said, oh, no, it's not. What would you say in response to some of the radical criticisms of it, right? Because, I mean, there's a certain line of, uh, you've, you've heard these things, I'm sure, right? I mean, what, I was one of them. I was one of those radical critics. <laughs> okay, so what do you make of the, the people on the left that, that are critical of 12-step programs? Oh, they, they hopefully have never had to go through some of what we went through and, and, and don't have to make the amends, steps eight and nine, that uh, some of us have to make because we were such... Uh, fuck ups and and, and 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 we were human and we were contradictory, you know. And that's the thing about this revolution we're trying to make in, in organizing. We're replete with all these contradictions. We're all walking contradictions. Unless we were born and raised in some revolutionary communist planet, Saturn or Mars, we were born and raised here with white supremacy, with machismo, with with backward thinking. Ernesto Che Guevara talked about how this society is one gigantic school of capitalism. And that's the beauty of, of visiting Cuba or Venezuela. I mean, Venezuela is not as advanced in terms of being a dictatorship of the proletariat as, as Cuba is. But in Cuba, you're not going to see Starbucks and you're not going to see McDonald's. You're going to see uh, our billboards, uh, Angela Davis and Asada Chicoa and, and Camilo Cienfuegos and Aide Santa Maria. And, and you're walking through Cuba like, what, what planet am I on where I don't have to be bombarded with thousands and thousands of subliminal and direct messages, consume this and consume that. Well, in terms of, of the rooms, um, I'll start with the personal and gravitate towards the, the political, more generalized, like Angela Dave, Davis has taught us um, in Women, Race, and Class, the personal is political. I'll never forget my um, first uh, meeting when I first claimed my, my seat. And you know I'm 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 a I'm the type of dude like you know I'm real drastic and and theatrical. So I had to walk to my first meeting. I had to walk from the Bronx all the way into Manhattan. I couldn't just take the train because I had to walk 150 blocks. It was some type of self castigation in the middle of winter. But I say that jokingly. But often because I work in the world of, of of sobriety too, and and if someone's really trying to kick that that dope or alcohol. The best thing you can do, long, long, long walks. The more, <laughs> the worse the weather, the better, the more intense, the more you appreciate when you get back to point A. Long Netflix series, you just have to keep your mind and, and, and you need that companionship. We can't do it by ourselves, which is something that Hillbilly Elegy actually shows. So my first meeting, I walked some 150 blocks and, and, and my homies were watching some boxing fight and they wanted me to come over and I was like, well, if I go that route, I'm going to end up, you know, where, where I was before. And I walked in, it's often in churches, so that can throw a lot of people off too. And that could be, you know, partially the reason for these critiques, but it's not religious, it's, it's spiritual. And churches often are the only places that can provide that free space because we always have Tradition 7 and we, we pass around the, the hat or the bucket, we all give a dollar, whatever, whatever, you keep the doors open. But of course, if you're in Midtown Manhattan or wherever, that can be very um, expensive. But I walked into my meeting. I, I, I really had only seen NA, AA, whatever, AA program, because um, there's many programs. There's Hoarders Anonymous, and there's, there's everything you could imagine. There's, I think it was even like a gang bangers. And on, I, there's everything out there. And I walked into this meeting, and um, I'm the type of person, I'm a student. If I'm going to Brazil, I'm a student of the MSCT. I'm a student of the Brazilian revolutionaries. I want to learn their language. I want to learn their slang. I want to. I want to know what soap operas are, are popular in Brazil. What's the messaging? So, I'm a student. So I sat in the front seats of of my first meeting because you know when you, when you first go, you're embarrassed and, and you're crying and you're disheveled. So most people they you know they go sit in the, in the very last seat in the back. But my per I sat in that 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 front seat. So everyone thought I was the qualifier. And I'm like, the qualifier? What, what, what? People, yeah, you're the qualifier. You're doing a qualification. And I'm like, what the f I don't even know what that means. But that's like the guest speaker. That's the person who's leading the share. And they assumed because I was sitting in the front and they didn't know me that I was brought in as the special guest speaker. But I was just trying to be in the thick of it. 
So for me, it made me more humble. It made me more grateful. You know, we say from shame uh, to grace, uh, we can all grow. Uh, we believe in, in the redemption of all human beings. And that's the Marxist Leninist uh, uh, in us, you know. Now, in terms of the, the, the political big picture, um, if you just stop at 12-step recovery, that's a spiritual program. But this 12-step recovery, like you said, throughout the world, yet every day there's more inequality. Every day, Jeff Bezos is worth more. Every day, you know, as soon as there was a coup in, in Bolivia, well, Tesla's stocks go up. So Bolivian people suffer, Wall Street celebrates. I mean, look at that dialectical relationship, right? So it's a zero-sum game. So I, I, don't, I'm, I don't think that 12-step recovery is healing humanity. I think it can heal people in terms of a spiritual solution um, to all types of character defects and, and the PTSD that often... And that, that's actually the core of this, this conversation. If you don't understand generational trauma, if you don't understand PTSD, we can't understand addiction. And shout out to Gabor Mate, I think Dr. Gabor Mate out of East Vancouver. Um, he's Hungarian, but his, his practice as a, as a radical, open-minded social worker is out of Vancouver, East Vancouver, Canada. Um, until we really get to the roots, the bigger roots, the overarching questions the overdoses, the imprisonment rates, because it's like you say, Caleb, it's not a war on drugs. It's a war on poor people. It's a war on black people. It's a war on Colombia. It's a war on Venezuela. It's a war on the world. It's a war on oppressed communities. So until we ask these big questions, nothing's going to, to change. So 12-step recovery is not some type of, of overarching solution, but at an individual level, of course, I recommend it to, to everybody. Interesting. Well, when you talk about PTSD, I mean, that, that raises the issue that I, I mentioned before, which is, uh, you know, it seems like, you know, people are taking drugs in a lot of cases to overcome pain, right? They, they have, you know, they're, 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 they talk about self-medicating or whatever, right? They have some, some pain in their past and such. Um, and, it seems like now, you know, I feel like there's there, one thing that's accompanying the rise of, of people, you know, you know, using opioids and such uh, is the, you know, is the legal prescribed medications that children in school, you know, if a kid is acting up, they immediately they prescribe him a drug, you know, um, and it seems like they hand out like candy to these. It used to be Ritalin. Back when I was a kid, it was Ritalin. They gave every kid who ever messed up Ritalin. Now they give people Risperdone. Uh, there is a number of these drugs they give to children, um, and it's a problem, I, I think. And that often, you know, when a child is is having trouble in school or not getting along with the other kids or having issues with their parents, there is some kind of underlying issue that is not they just have the wrong chemical in their body. And the phrase chemical imbalance is used as a way to push drugs that don't really resolve the problem. And then on top of that, that child then enters adulthood chemically dependent on a substance that they have to get from big pharma, uh, you know, spending their life adjusting their doses and all of that. And I mean, I've, I've seen that happen. I mean, the number of people that are on, you know, psych meds is not a small number. And, you know, I mean, it shouldn't be this high, right? If, if the issue was just simply uh, a disease, I wouldn't be like, I believe it's one in five adults in the United States takes antidepressants. Right. I think we have a problem in our society that people are that depressed, not a problem in in the chemicals in people's minds. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, I mean, do you see a link between the, the recreational addictions and the, you know, the prescribed uh, over prescription and what's being done to children? Oh, 100 percent. It's all so interconnected. And if we live in the greatest country in the world and this is the greatest democracy ever that bombs every other country around the world, um, we have to unpack all of that rhetoric. And again, to go back to this, you know, this $25 trillion economy, yet the highest rates of insomnia, the highest rates of depression, the highest rates of medication. There's an incredible campaign. Uh, I think the hashtag was don't label us, don't label our, our children. But, you know, my children growing up, um, they were labeled as, as slow and they sent in the speech therapists and I'm looking at the speech therapists because they, they mandate these things and they try to get involved, you know, Agency of Child Services and ACS and who knows what. ACS is a whole nother, you know, conversation. But it's like my, my children weren't slow with their speech. They were bilingual. 
<laughs> they grew up speaking more languages than the speech therapist coming in. But because they weren't at that first grade rate, they were supposed to. Be, so they're so quick to label our children. Mm -hmm. There's an incredible meme that I saw. It, it's been tough to uh, find it because I always love to share it um, with my students. But there's this meme of, of African children. I don't know if it's in the savannas of, of Kenya or Tanzania. But it's a meme of African children, 12, 13 years old. And, and they're out and they're free. In, in nature, in the savanna, in the mountains, with, with, with wildlife and, and, and freedom and self-determining. And they're reflecting and they're saying, I heard about these kids across the world in the United States, and they have to sit at a desk for eight hours. And if they don't sit at that desk for eight hours, they lose their half an hour break, which is called recess. And if they can't go to recess, they get uh, even you know, even more pissed off. And then they come and they give them drugs and pills. So from that standpoint, right, because we live in this, in sociology, they call it cultural relativism. Mm -hmm. You don't judge another culture through this culture's eyes, right? Mm -hmm. And we can also call it, you know, ethnocentrism. In this country, it's American exceptionalism is nothing but ethnocentrism, right? So yeah, well, what they're doing to our children with over-medication and this whole pandemic, has exacerbated everything. And that's why there's more overdoses and more children who are hyperactive and higher rates of domestic abuse and sexual violence because suddenly all the family contradictions, which were already exploding, are more compressed together. So I think these are legitimate societal issues. I think a lot of people who are sharing with us right now, I can't wait to read people's comments, uh, are gonna make the same conclusions that, like Malcolm X said, a chicken cannot lay a goose egg. This system cannot deliver, cannot produce self-determination for our people. Uh, immigrants, black, LGBTQ, poor whites, across the board, women, this system cannot produce its diametrical opposite, which is self-determination in an economic sense, in a cultural sense, in a linguistic sense, in an educational sense. So to, under, to unpack any one of these points, you have to begin to connect the dots. And Tupac has this great quote. Tupac Shakur said, if there's dope in our communities, why isn't there a class to understand dope? Why isn't there a class if, if the White House has 50 spare rooms, and that's a you know an underestimate for the White House. Why aren't homeless people housed in those fifty spare rooms? That's the first thing I would. This is a fifteen-year-old, sixteen-year-old Tupac in Baltimore. Everyone should check out that that Tupac. Um, you know he's basically a teenager, but Tupac knew it when he was fifteen, and he knew it when he was gunned down at, at twenty-five. So it's not an educational system; it's a miseducational system. And if we don't understand the role of the miseducational system, we can't understand the role of, of the media machine. And if we don't understand that, we can't understand how um, this myth-making machine is bamboozling us from every angle. And like Fred Hampton said, we come up with answers that don't answers and solutions that don't, that don't solve. So that's why we keep doing this popular education work. Everyone listening, join a, a revolutionary study group, join a revolutionary organization, follow more podcasts. And, and that's what I admire about you, Caleb. I mean, how many books do you read a day? How many articles do you cover in a week? Could you be coming up with stuff that I'm like, what, what, where did he come up with this? And that's how I've tried to raise my two sons. Question everything, read everything, and, and debate these things. Well, I admire the work that you do. Uh, whenever I, I turn on the TV and I hear you talking about Latin America on RT or, or on press TV, I know that you're bringing the revolutionary anti-imperialist perspective, and you've been in this for the long haul. No doubt about it. I think we've been on many picket lines together over the years. Uh, no doubt about it. Um, well, you know, I wanted to, you know, make one observation because, you know, we talk about now they're they're putting kids on on medications. That's a big thing, right? Um, and and it it seems like, you know, you know, when you talk about PTSD and intergenerational trauma, a lot of people will talk about, you know, corporal punishment and, you know, spanking is, you know, that's, you know. And it, it, what's interesting is, you know, that, that goes on in every culture. I mean, that's just, you know, a thing that goes on. But in Britain, in like the, the early 1800s, as the Victorian stuff is starting, there became kind of an odd fixation on it around the same time that they were becoming very much a, a capitalist imperialist power. Right. And you have, you know, you have like the, the instructions that parents are getting. They're telling their, you know, parents, 
don't hug your children too much or they'll become weak and soft. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, and and, you know, and then, you know, the, in Britain, you know, they, they tend to beat children with with sticks, of course, the, the cane. But they're importing like special wood from from Southeast Asia, from countries like Vietnam and Thailand, you know, the special rattan stick that is just like perfect for beating children because it, you know, it will it will hurt the most, but it's like it's, you know, light so you can swing it faster. And it's it's almost like kind of a demented cultural fixation that comes up in in the Victorian British era. And of course, they then export that to every place they colonize. Right. And it's this this cultural kind of obsession with, you know, children must be beaten. They must be struck on their buttocks as a way to control them. Um, and it's almost kind of demented in a way. There's almost a, a weird like crypto sexual edge to it. Like what in the world is going on here? Um, and uh, you know, that's happening around the same time, you know, we get the, the world's first serial killer. Finally, in 1888, we have Jack the Ripper, right? And he's the first, the first case of what you can call a serial killer. This is a, a, a man who hires sex workers and cuts them to pieces for his own sexual pleasure. And this had never been seen anywhere in the world, this kind of behavior. People are like, what, what is going on here, right? There's been murderers before of, of all stripes. But, um, but, you know, as the British Empire is arising and as they're making a conscious effort to kind of try to breed their people to be kind of heartless killers and go to Africa and like, you know, gun people down and, and to commit the horrendous atrocities, uh, part of that is kind of, you know, you know, getting people to stop showing affection to their children, uh, you know, kind of, you know, cultivating, you know, the beating of children as kind of a ritualized thing that must go on. Um, and, and that seemed to be part of developing an imperialist culture. Um, in my book, City Builders and Vandals, I talk about the Atlanticist pathology. And I talk about, you know, that kind of developing. And a lot of the, the intergenerational trauma that people talk about in oppressed communities and all of that seems to be rooted in some of that and the way that, that British imperialism kind of modeled the world and told people they should live in their family life and such. It seems to have kind of distorted and, and perverted the whole culture. What's interesting, though, is it seems like we're in a period of a shift where that kind of Atlanticist model of imperialism is coming apart. Um, and, it, you know, and now instead of like beating kids in school, you know, they're giving kids drugs, right? That's that's the way to control kids. And it seems like now, you know, they've noticed that serial killers, you know, the axe murdering, you know, the guy, you know, Jack the Ripper type stuff, it really doesn't go on as much as it used to. The number of people doing that has actually significantly declined. What we have now is we have mass shooters. We have, you know, the, the young white male who shows up at his sh school and shoots up the place and kills all of his classmates in a hail of bullets. That didn't used to go on, right? That really it was 98, 99 when we started seeing a real rise of that with the Columbine massacre. And, and now that seems to be the new kind of criminal pathology. Um, as you know, the imperialist global setup is kind of transitioning in its way of way of approaching people. Um, and it seems like, you know, the imperialists, there's no shortage of, of kind of pathological ways of trying to socially engineer people and control people. Uh, but you can look into, you know, what the British Empire did, you know, with the opium trade and and with the way they were kind of breeding people and Atlanticism and and all the kind of pathologies and insanity that arose from the, the, the era where you had classical imperialism that Lenin writes about in imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. But it seems like we're entering kind of a new stage where, you know, I mean, at this point, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that held imperialism together in its heyday was what you call the aristocracy of labor which was a layer of workers, working class people in the homeland who had such a, you know, a higher standard of living in comparison to other workers in the homeland, especially in comparison to the people in the developing world, that they were loyal to empire. You know, in the United States, the reason the imperialists were able to do what they did is because there was a layer of well-paid white workers who were loyal to empire. And uh, the same in Britain, the cultivation of the, the labor aristocracy. And Lenin wrote about this and dividing the working class and, you know, this, this layer of, of white workers that have a certain amount of privilege that held together imperialism because that, you know, giving them a few crumbs bought their loyalty to empire. Um, but it seems like what's going on right now is that there is a, a, an effort all throughout the Western imperialist countries to demolish the, the labor aristocracy. Right. I mean, you just don't have that white picket fence anymore. You don't have that, you know, that suburban, you know, uh, you know, nuclear family, that that layer of well-paid white workers that kind of held U.S. society together and was the right wing kind of bulwark that enabled the imperialists to do all the horrible things they did around the world and to the, the black people of the South and to the Chicano people. Uh, they don't have that strata anymore. I mean, they don't need them anymore. Automation has kind of eliminated them from the assembly line. They've got a globalized apparatus of production. 
And then a lot of what Trump is about is trying to say he can somehow magically bring the labor aristocracy back, which he can't do, right? I mean, that, you know, that's what he, when he was saying, make America great again, that's really what he was trying to tell the, you know, the white working class. I will, I will bring back the, the 1950s and 60s labor aristocracy. I, see, I feel like that's what he was saying. He obviously can't do that. Uh, the answer is solidarity. I mean, the, o the only ways that, that white workers have ever really gained has been in alliance with black workers, right? I mean, black and white unite and fight. I mean, the labor unions of the 1930s were built when the Communist Party, you know, went to the dock workers of San Francisco and said, you've got to, you know, get rid of this whites only clause in your, your labor union. You've got to align with the black community and you've got to make one of the demands of your strike that black dock workers get hired. Um, and the same in the auto plants, you know, and, and it used to be in San Francisco uh, when the dock workers would go on strike or when the auto workers in Detroit would go on strike, that the black community were used as scab labor. But when the unions got rid of their racism and allowed black people to join the unions and actually started fighting for the demands of black people and demanding that black people get jobs on the docks and get jobs in the factories, that's when the labor movement was successful. That's when they actually, you know, were winning huge victories in the 1930s, when the Communist Party said black and white, united fight and and put the needs of black workers first. And that the gains for the white working class have always come when they stood in solidarity with the black working class against the imperialists. And now that we're seeing the labor aristocracy being demolished, I feel like, you know, in the short term, yes, we're seeing a rise of Trumpism and racism, but that's the short term. I feel like in the long term, this is opening the door to more solidarity than we've ever seen before. Where, you know, I mean, I mean, the drug issue, for example, it used to be the white communities were the ones cheering for the war on drugs. You know, lock them up. You know, drugs was almost a code word for black people. Well, now, you know, now that, that the opioid epidemic has devastated so many white working class families, uh, now we have Republicans talking about more compassion for, for drug users and such. And I feel like, you know, despite everything, you know, getting worse, there's potential now for more solidarity between uh, of the working class against, you know, racism, against the whole capitalist system and against what the capitalists are doing to the world uh, as they kind of are demolishing the first world and kind of lowering the standards of the first world. Uh, as they set up kind of a global apparatus of production, uh, that lays the basis for a new level of internationalism and solidarity. And I think we can be optimistic about that. Do you think I'm right in my optimism? Yeah, I appreciate the revolutionary optimism. Uh, there's so many barriers. I mean, in terms of the aristocracy of labor, one way it still plays out is the fact that I can be poor here, but my U.S. dollar, if I go to Mexico, it's worth 22 times the Mexican peso. If I go to the Dominican Republic, it's worth 59 times the Dominican peso. If I go to Venezuela, not that any Americans are even allowed to go to Venezuela because the United States makes it illegal to go to any socialist country, any blockaded country. When I first went to um, Cuba in 1995, just to go to Cuba, I risked a $100,000 fine and 10 years in prison. And they did actually lock us up on the border for um, a few days before we were allowed to get into Montreal and, and go to um, Cuba. So this aristocracy of labor, there is still incredible relative uh, privilege. Uh, one U.S. dollar this morning in Venezuela was worth 1.9 million bolivares. So a Venezuelan worker right now is making something like 50 cents uh, per month. And, and of course, the devaluation of a people's currency is a neo-colonial tactic to control that people. And then as soon as those people flee their homeland because they can't survive, there's CNN and MSNBC to, to film them leaving and say, socialism is a failure. We, we told you. And the New York Times, they're so expert at their, uh, their propaganda. But I think you're correct in terms of that multinational unity. Um, I like what you were saying about integration at the same time. I mean, segregation is, is as American as, as apple pie. You can feel it when you visit. I had mentioned East Cleveland earlier in, in, in the South Bronx, um, where I've lived for so many years. I mean, it's still just in our face, the segregation. You take the New York City train and you know where is gentrified and where is old money, the Upper East Side. And then you just take that five train, another three stops, boom, you're in the South Bronx. You're in the capital of asthma for this entire country. You're in a place where the average uh, median income for a family is less than $26,000. So um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, work in, 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 in front of us. I thought it was interesting when you mentioned the Jack the Ripper, the first serial killer, 1888. 
1888, there was still slavery. Slavery was still legal in Brazil. So everything that, quote unquote, Western civilization, I love that that Gandhi quote when a Western reporter said to Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And Gandhi said, I think it would be a good idea to have it one day. In other words, the most barbaric, and then to quote Rosa Luxemburg, it's, it's not a choice between capitalism and socialism, it's a choice between capitalism and annihilation and, and, and barbarism, but the chickens have come home to roost in terms of uh, all these colonial adventures. And when you were describing that twisted um, pseudo-sexual stuff playing out in English families in the disunited kingdom, because there's no United Kingdom. You know, Ireland clamors to be united as 32 counties, and in Scotland has its uh, its struggle, and, and of course Wales and the English working people as well have always, um, you know, have their own historical struggle. But uh, when you were describing those dystopian images of the English families, it brought me back to like some Pink Floyd. I mean, I think Pink Floyd like did that whole, the wall, the whole album coming directly out of everything that you were describing. Um, when you listen to their lyrics, that's, that's what I get. It was, it was a social rebellion um, against that generation that came before them, just like the 1960s here was rebelling against the authoritarianism. Um, that strict McCarthyism of the 1950s. And my mother, because people might, you know, people must wonder, well, why, why was he reading George Jackson in, in seventh grade? Why was he reading Claude McKay? And why was he reading Malcolm X? I think I'd read Malcolm X's autobiography twice before I even entered high school. And that's because of my mother. And my mother was a product of those, those hippie times. Um, you know, honestly, my mother was more of a hippie than a revolutionary. We don't have to go down that road. But she she raised me on the Irish liberation struggle and um in, in Bobby Sands. I mean, talk about a revolt against uh, you know, British control. And uh I still work closely um with uh uh Red Flame, um Laser Derg the Irish name for Red Flame in the six counties. Everyone should should check them out. So my mother, um, she was in Ireland. She was in the middle of the Trumbles when her something was wrong with her belly and she was hitchhiking. And that's when Belfast and Derry were were ghost towns. And she had come up through Portugal and that was back when you could you could hitchhike. And something wasn't quite right. All these peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but she was getting sick. And there I was, uh, shadow boxing in her womb. And she was pregnant with me. So I was a product of that, of that wanderlust, of that internationalism. Um, and I'm just thankful to my mom, who there's a slogan uh, in the murals of uh, Belfast that says, uh, repression breeds resistance. And that resistance brings our freedom. And I think my mother, you know, shout out to her, Karen Mahoney, she synthesizes she synthesizes that repression that can breed resistance. And I'm just thankful that she exposed me from a young age because most people in my family, I didn't grow up with my father. He was never a father. He was never there for me. But when he did catch wind that I was reading um, about the IRA or that I admired the IRA, you know, because he, he comes from his Irish blood and he's like, those goddamn bomb throwers. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, we're all products of the insidiousness of the of the of the contradiction. So for me, even though I didn't know it back then, the personal was very political. And I was on this voyage, I was on this mission to understand. And, and another big piece, I don't want to cut off more than we can chew, but I'll just throw this out there and there could be a part two down the line. Who knows if if I can't wait to read people's comments because we've covered a lot of ground. But um People like that, so let's do it. <laughs> yeah. When I was unpacking the whole addiction thing in my family, I was actually out at a I was out at a at a wedding in the in the West. And it was a Buddhist wedding, but it was a bunch of white people Buddhists. It was interesting. And it was in 2009, so it was the quote unquote green revolution in Iran. And all these liberals were cheering on, oh, the Iranians are, are fighting for their freedom. And I'm I'm there just like super isolated. Um, because I, I, I knew I couldn't trust MSNBC and, and, and all of their propaganda, but all these white people cheering on 
you know, another potential color revolution. And to this day, that's what they're trying to do in Iran. We can see through it very clearly. Not to say that the Iranian social formation doesn't have its, its contradictions, but uh, I was at this, this wedding and I met different people and, and bonded with them. It was 2009 and I was on a mission to understand the addiction. Where did the addiction come from? And, and some of the big answers for me building with, with people at that event out west in the, in the mountains. Um, if you don't understand the generational trauma, if you don't understand the PTSD, and you gave a few potential scenarios where some of the trauma could come from, whether it was some type of sexual abuse in the family or, or, or sexual trauma or um, physical abuse or, or all these things that we've survived and, 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 and witnessed. And when I started to look at the statistics in the studies, Hardcore drug users, so you know, I'm talking the crack and the heroin and the cocaine and the crystal meth or hardcore alcoholics. The numbers were staggering. Most people, um, women especially, children especially, had been through this horrific PTSD. They had the survivors of all of this different stuff. And being in the rooms, being in recovery, you just hear it over and over and over. And again, that's why beyond the rooms, then you have to ask, well. It's not just our little uh, AA group here or NA group here or SLAA group out in, in the Midwest. It, it, it's, it's everywhere. It's generalized across this society. And that's when you start to ask the bigger questions. And that led me to write a piece called Theorizing Rape and Incest to Live Among Broken Men. Because I saw in my own family, <laughs> English working class, Scottish, Irish roots, Finnish roots, Austrian-Hungarian, you know, all this, this this melting pot of different European um, cultures and immigrant experiences. And, and I'm like, why why do these themes, these threads, you know, I didn't, I, we don't decide to write about these things. These things write us. I didn't wake up one morning like, oh, I think I want to write about incest and I want to write about heroin. I mean, there's, there's much lovelier things to write about. But if that's, the, if that's where, if that's the insidiousness I come from, then I have some type of human responsibility to turn on it. And before we can um, overthrow it, before we can have a, have a social upheaval, we have to identify it. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's, what, that's what led me to, to ask these big questions and, and to write these pieces. Very good. Well, where can people check out your work, Danny? Yeah, um, check out Anti-Conquista. Um, I work closely with Anti-Conquista. We started a project called Sons of Fidel and Daughters of Fidel, a podcast taking up these big questions from an anti-imperialist angle. On Sunday night, we did a, a panel everyone should check out called uh, <laughs> Fuck Identity Politics, Fuck Liberal Identity Politics. I think we can all agree um, what the liberals have done with identity politics is truly criminal. I, my, my favorite meme, I think the most important meme in these Kamala Harris, Joe Biden times is they, they show four um, <clears throat> U.S. jets dropping bombs in the Middle East and South America. And in and, and, and the Bush one says whatever Bush's slogan was and Obama says, yes, we can. And 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 um, si se puede. And then the Trump one says, make America great again. And here comes the Biden military jet dropping bombs and it has the rainbow flag. And it has Black Lives Matter, and it had all has all the politically correct liberal BS. So people can check out, you know, fuck liberal identity politics on on Anti Conquista's YouTube channel. I mentioned the two pieces that kind of form um, the basis of this, which led me to write a book called My Son Blazes Within Me. So many contradictions, so little time. Um, because I felt like I owed it to my mother, my grandmother, my sisters, my siblings, my brothers, my uncles, my, my grandfather, just this, uh, litany of, of, of generational trauma. And I knew I, in the, in the rooms, we say, I don't suffer from terminal uniqueness. Cause when you go into recovery, you always think, oh, my story is the most shameful and I'm so embarrassed. And then you hear other stories and you're like, no, nah, I'm just another bozo on the bus. There's nothing different about our stories. It manifests differently. My DOC, my drug of choice was this. Someone else's drug of choice was, was that. So yeah, I, I look forward to um, continuing this dialogue. I think tonight's just a beginning. You know, Once I can see people's comments and, and we can respond 
you know, we're all in this um, um, together. I did a piece with, with Max Blumenthal and, and Ben Norton. They do amazing work at Moderate Rebels in the, in the gray zone. Consistent anti-imperialism. All power to the Haitian people. All power to the Ecuadorian people. They inspire us. Uh, the Brazilian people are rising up against Bolsonaro's proto wannabe fascism. So these are exciting times, uh, Caleb, and, and the revolutionary optimism that you transmit, you know, uh, we're just going to keep moving forward. Absolutely. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. We will definitely have you back. Um, I'm excited to post this. So uh, thank you very much, Danny. Uh, and and we'll, we will be in touch. All take good. Care, brother. Be well. Take, take care.